from student of science. I'm a student of Dr. Rosemarie Friedman, and this is a work of ours called Entropy Accumulation and Post Quantum Cryptographic Sections. Uh, I'll outline. I'll introduce you to the subject. Uh, I'll explain what it is you'll see today, explain the setting, what I mean by computational assumptions and uh, entropy accumulation, present two of the tools we used in order to show entropy accumulation, uh, present an example of uh, where we have entropy accumulation rates, and end with a summary and open questions. Uh, so what is it you'll see today? Consider a classical verifier interacting with, uh, through classical communication with a quantum polynomial time device. <clears throat> with this setting in mind, we want to answer the question, how does one use the entropy accumulation theorem uh, combined with computational assumptions? And this is interesting for a number of reasons. Uh, first, it connects strong quantum information theoretic tools with computational ones. It was previously thought impossible. It provides concrete values rather than uh, asymptotic statements. And it's a proof technique that can be easily used in other computational settings and thus allows clear comparison between uh, computational protocols. Uh, so more, more about the setting. Uh, we have a classical verifier, you could think of it as myself, interacting uh, with a quantum prover, some black box, and my goal is to extract randomness out of this box. But in device-independent setting, I do not trust this box, and even worse, I'll assume that it was uh, manufactured by, by some adversarial uh, entity attempting to trick me. And one way to handle this problem is uh, by interacting with two boxes. Uh, I'll assume that the two boxes are uh, space-like separated. They cannot communicate. And after performing some experiment, I may uh, observe a violation of Bell inequality. Uh, and I may conclude that the devices share the EPR pair. And when you measure such a pair, the outcome is random and nobody else uh, is entangled to this uh, state. So we just witnessed a coin flip. The coin flip happened right now and nobody else knows the result. But when I'm interacting with just a single device, uh, obviously space, spatial separation assumptions are irre irrelevant and there's no randomness to be extracted. Uh, so these assumptions have to be replaced with something else and that something else uh, is the computational assumptions. Uh, these computational assumptions have two parts. First is the assumption that the device I'm interacting with is computationally bounded. And the second is that there exists some problem that even a quantum device cannot solve. Uh, so under these assumptions, we'll perform some interaction. And at the end of this interaction, uh, I, the verifier, will hold two things. O, an output uh, which would be the designated uh, coin flip or my randomness. And S, which describes the transcript between myself and the device. Um, and what I just described is a single, uh, single round, and at the end of which I have a single, at most, a single bit of randomness. But in reality, I would like to perform this uh, uh, interaction in a sequential uh, uh, way with uh, many rounds of interaction. And this is uh, demonstrated by this uh, graphic, where at the start of the process, uh, we receive some state uh, that is given to the verifier and the prover. They perform some interaction and there's an output O inside information S and uh, then repeat the process and each step in the process may depend on previous steps. Uh, all while the adversary may hold uh, a purification of the states we're working with. And the main question we want to answer is to, uh, we want to give some uh, statement regarding this uh, quantity. This is the smooth mean entropy which relates to how well can an adversary guess the output O given the side information S. And uh, the entropy accumulation answers this question. It says that if we can provide a lower bound on the von Neumann entropy of a single round, uh, this uh, smooth mean entropy will grow linearly with this quantity minus some correction that grows like square root of n. But uh, for, for, in order for us to use the entropy accumulation theorem, the main thing we need to provide is a lower bound on this von Neumann entropy. And this is what we'll, we'll be trying to do. Um, so we use a number of tools. And uh, I would like to say that there are a number of uh, single device interaction protocols. They have various goals, various settings, and uh, assumptions. 
and I would like to focus specifically on the work by Berkersky, Cristiano, Mahadev, uh, Vazirani, and Vidic, because we take their computational assumptions and their cryptographic primitives uh, they construct and take it as a case study to show an example of entropy accumulation. So the first tool we use, uh, which they construct, is uh, the trapdoor claw free function pair. These are a pair of two functions uh, whose image, uh, whose domain and range are binary strings of length n. And they're called uh, uh, claw free. They're called claw free because it is hard to find the claw. And the claw is a pair of two inputs, x0 and x1, that are sent by both functions respectively to the same output. And this is hard uh, both for a quantum and a classical device. They're called trapdoor because there may exist, there exists some secret information regarding the inner workings of these functions uh, that allows efficient inversion. Meaning, if you give me a binary string here, it is easy for me to invert uh, as a holder of this trapdoor to invert these functions and find x0 and x1. And although a quantum device cannot solve this problem, you, uh, you may still hold an advantage in the form of being able to uh, make a superposition of two uh, inputs that go to the same output. Uh, so let's assume now uh, I'm interacting with an honest prover. We perform the we exchange some messages, and at this point, the prover has committed to an output y that has uh, pre images x0 and x1. And I, the verifier, may challenge this prover for one of two challenges either pi or m. Pi challenge corresponds to a computational basis measurement of this state, which would return either x0 or x1 and we mark it as zero or one uh, result in the pi uh, challenge. Or I could uh, challenge this uh, prover to an M challenge, which corresponds to a Hadamard basis measurement of this state again, which would return a bit u, a string d, such that this equation is solved. And I won't explain why it uh, in fact uh, returns a solution to this equation, but the th important thing to note is that it sort of testifies uh, that the prover does hold uh, some information about the superposition of the two inputs. And we mark a win if we, uh, the prover returns a correct pre-image uh, or uh, returns a correct solution to this equation. And at the end, outputs either a win or a loss. And if you lost me in the last two slides, it's fine. This can be simplified in the following way. We just abstract this interaction uh, in a box. The box receives either an input pi and input m and then announces either a win or a loss. And due to the computational assumptions, these two uh, measurements or challenges should be anti-commuting. Uh, the second tool we use are the entropic uncertainty relations. And they have a very nice geometrical interpretation. Uh, let's assume I have some state rho, and I have two measurements, pi and m, which correspond to the challenges I give to the, uh, to the prover. They have some angle between them. And a special case of the entropic uncertainty relations state that, states that the sum of the two entropies of the measurements is larger than some monotonically rising function uh, of the angle between these measurements. So if I want to make pi as my designated uh, coin flip, then I should make sure that this angle is large and that the entropy of m is small. Um, so using all of these, we do in fact manage to provide a lower bound on the von Neumann entropy of a single round. And this expression only appears here for shock value. Uh, it could be simplified to these four terms. <clears throat> the first is some statement regarding the angle between the measurements, which uh, comes from the computational assumptions. The second term uh, comes from the ent entropic uncertainty relations under the assumption that our uh, angle is uh, larger than some value c. Uh, the third is some correction term, which I will address at the end. And the last term also comes from the computational assumptions, uh, and it corresponds to the computational power that the prover holds. Uh, so we have a lower bound on the von Neumann entropy as a function of two variables, winning probability in each challenge, and we manage to show uh, uh, the von Neumann, a lower bound on the von Neumann entropy as a function of two variables. 
And before I proceed, I would like to uh, give a huge disclaimer that the numbers you are seeing here are very, very bad. And uh, they result uh, in a demand in a very large number of, uh, uh, of steps in the interaction in the sequential process. I'll address it in the end, but for now, please bear with me. And we, ha we just have a lower bound on the von Neumann entropy as a function of two variables. We could uh, reduce it to a single winning probability by sort of taking a slice of the three-dimensional graph, which results in this graph. And we do see, in fact, that when we have perfect winning probability, we do reach uh, a von Neumann value of one. And if you recall from the beginning, uh, I mentioned that the main thing we need for the entropy accumulation theorem is a lower bound on the von Neumann entropy, which we do now have as a function of a single winning probability. And so we're able to use the entropy accumulation theorem. We, assuming we repeat the sequential process for n rounds, we normalize the uh, smooth mean entropy on the left by n, and we call the term on the right the entropy accumulation rate. An example for such an entropy accumulation rate, uh, let's assume we repeat the sequential process for 10 to the 26 number of repetitions. We can uh, now relate every winning probability to an entropy accumulation rate. And we see that the more we repeat the experiment, the more sequential rounds we have in our sequential process, the closer we are to the uh, von Neumann bound and the uh, uh, IID uh, scenario, meaning we do in fact observe the uh, behavior expected by the entropy accumulation theorem. So summary and open questions. Summary, the, the main thing I would like you to take uh, with you is that if you have a computational test with anti-commuting measurements, <clears throat> then you can use this proof technique to certify randomness. Uh, this proof is modular and easy to use, uh, easy to generalize to other computational uh, settings. There's no need to work with smooth mean entropies directly. Uh, it's a huge benefit. And it yields concrete uh, values of entropy accumulation rates rather than just asymptotic uh, statements. There already exist two examples, recent examples of uh, anti-commuting measurements in uh, computational challenges. Uh, the first of which uh, appeared here on Monday. And another thing is that this same method can be used with all versions of uh, entropy accumulation theorem, in particular uh, newer versions that exist. Open questions. Uh, obviously, the rates I've seen you are not very good. And there are a number of points in the proof method that I can point to that uh, I believe have caused this issue. Uh, and I would like to mention the main one. Uh, is that the pi challenge, the pre-image challenge, actually has three outcomes and not just two. Uh, when using our proof, we reduced the problem to a collection of uh, qubits using the Jordan lemma decomposition. But this assumes that we have two measurements with two outcomes each. Uh, and it is not the case here because pi actually has three outcomes, which results in the correction term you saw. Uh, so uh, one uh, possibility to solve this issue is just to use this proof technique in a protocol where uh, there are only two, two outcomes for each challenge. Another improvement, but uh, this would not be a significant one, is to use this uh, proof technique with newer versions of the entropy accumulation theorem, which do exist. The second open question is uh, perhaps bounding this negligible element, uh, but this would require uh, making concrete statements regarding the computational power that the prover I'm interacting with holds, because it's not enough just to say, uh, this device is polynomial. And another open question is to consider computationally efficient states. When using the entropy accumulation theorem, uh, we're looking for a lower bound on the von Neumann entropy that results with a winning probability omega. And we consider all possible state with such winning probability omega. Uh, now, an interesting open question would be, Possibly, uh, could we perhaps uh, formalize a, uh, a version of the entropy accumulation theorem that only takes a subset of this uh, set that only considers computationally efficient states 
uh, which may improve the rates we're seeing here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. Do we have any questions? This one. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering when you applied this complementarity um, statement, you said yeah. that the angle somehow you can lower bound with the computational assumptions. Uh, Do you so have any intuitions for how, why this is true? Uh, you mean this one? Um, one, yes. I mean the, the theta there. Yes, this, yeah, okay. this part, yes. Um, so basically, if you could solve both challenges, then uh, uh, if there's no angle between them, then this whole thing is classical and you can solve all problems uh, at the same time by just applying and rewinding. And uh, this would break uh, the computational assumptions. So if you're seeing a correct answer on both challenges, this means that there exists some angle between them. And the larger the winning probability you have in both challenges corresponds to a larger angle between them. Okay, thank you. Okay, more questions? Yes, over there. Uh, hello, sort of related to this and the questions you raised. You say that one potential improvement might be if you restrict to computationally efficient yeah. states, but uh, in order to get this bound in the first place, don't you sort of kind of need to restrict the family of states? Because like Eve has, can only do computationally efficient attacks or something like that? I mean, uh, yeah, you know, in a way you're right. I don't think that specifically they, this thing may help specifically in this protocol. Um, and there is sort of a restriction by assuming that you're working with uh, polynomial states. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it is sort of a restriction. Uh, but, but I would like to also add that uh, specific uh, that an improvement of uh, uh, that this mentioned the improvement is a problem not specifically in this uh, uh, in this setting, but it's a, a more fundamental problem with the entropy accumulation theorem. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah that right. I agree. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thank you. Any further questions? So yeah. I, had a, I had a question. Um, so I, I assume you're you're not allowing the adversary to get the device back at, at the end. Uh, at the end, no, you he may receive it back. In fact, so he can have the yeah. the state of the device. He can even further furthermore, he can even have the trap door. Uh, and there are no computational assumptions regarding the adversary. There are computational assumptions regarding the prover. Uh, so I may assume that. Uh, the adversarial entity holds like all the, it can uh, in fact solve this problem, but this should be still safe. Thanks. Okay. 